Welcome, dear viewers and listeners. This is AuthorCast, and today we have Jan Pritzker here, uh, the author of Inventing Bitcoin that we are publishing currently in Finnish and in Dutch, and hopefully many other languages to come. Jan, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I am well, thank you so much. And thanks for publishing the book. I really appreciate that. And I love reaching, you know, an audience in every language. So much appreciated on that work. Thank you. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And the, yeah, it's a great book. It's one of those books that I tend to recommend as uh, newcomers to grab. Uh, maybe amongst with the little Bitcoin book, this is like more a tech, more of like a little technical Bitcoin book, in my opinion. <laughs> so uh, it kind of uh, answers a lot of the FUD and the, and the, you know, the misunderstandings around Bitcoin, I would say, in an easy to understand way. So maybe, maybe talk a little bit about uh, why did you choose to write the book this way and who is it meant for? Yeah. So the process of writing the book was actually pretty interesting because it was essentially mirroring my own Bitcoin journey. Uh, so I started uh, really researching Bitcoin around 2016, uh, summer of 2016, when it was like in the 400, 500, 600 range. And yeah, I had multiple touch points with Bitcoin in the past, but didn't really understand what it was and never really kind of took the time to, to dig into it. So in 2016, when I started researching it, I uh, was listening to all these videos and um, podcasts and, you know, Andreas Antonopoulos and, and that kind of thing that was going on around that time. And I started understanding Bitcoin first from a technical side, because I am a technology person. Uh, and I've been spending my career in startups and, and writing software and architecture and, and that kind of thing. So at first I approached it very much from a tech standpoint and, you know, it's an interesting distributed system and, you know, it's kind of solving this problem of being able to, anybody can participate in the network and, uh, it's permissionless and all that. And that was really cool. And so as I started getting deeper into it by 2018, I started having the concept of, I was, you know, I was explaining Bitcoin to people all the time, right? It became the, the Bitcoin person and my friends, um, they started inviting me to give talks. Uh, a lot of my friends are actually teachers. So they started giving me uh, invitations to go to their high schools and talk to their students about Bitcoin. So I started explaining Bitcoin to high schoolers. And this is where um, really the book started. It was me taking notes and really thinking about what, what do I want to talk to uh, high school people about? How do I explain Bitcoin? And when I started taking these notes, I, you know, very quickly they turned into chapters and, and became very, very meaty. And I said, okay, I have kind of the beginning of a book here. And so originally when I started writing it, it was really intended for a high school audience. And, and I kind of wanted it at that level where you don't really need a deep understanding of math, economics, uh, technology. It's all kind of there on a one-on-one level so that if you have that basic understanding of each of those fields, you should be able to understand Bitcoin. Um, that was my goal and, and really to stay away from code, stay away from really deep technical stuff. And uh, like I said, I, I approached the book from a tech angle and that's why it actually has a subtitle of something like, you know, the uh, the decentralized, I don't even know what, what it is, the first decentralized uh, money, it's technology behind the first decentralized money explained, I think is what it is. So it's a really terribly long subtitle. But the point is that I came at it from the tech side. And as I was redoing research for the book, I re realized that I can't just explain Bitcoin from a technical standpoint, unless I explain what the problems that Satoshi was solving are. And that's when the book really took a big turn into the motivation side and understanding the why, the why of Bitcoin and all this uh, monetary history and Satoshi's writing and all this kind of stuff crept into it because I realized it can't just say, okay, this is how Bitcoin works. We, if you don't understand what problems you're solving, you're not going to be able to understand the solutions either. Yeah, f funny you should mention the high school because that's uh, usually what I tell people. Like, if you if you have a, like high school level understanding of things, then this book is going to pose no problem for you. And I would even say you don't even need that necessarily. Like, if you have a curious mind and you have you have a logical mind and you can look up a lot of those things, there's definitely no hurdle to anybody to grab this book if you want to learn about the you know technical side of the uh, Bitcoin. A protocol in an easy to understand way. So it's uh, in no means technical. There's no code in this. And I'm not a technical person either. And, I, and, and by the way, my mom really liked this book. <laughs> so <Nice>. uh, <laughs> she, she was actually like, proofreading the Finnish version for me. Um, and she really liked it. And I, w I was really happy because I've been trying to orange peel my parents. Like I, I'm sure most of the uh, you know listeners and, and viewers have the same experience. And it's sometimes it's an uphill battle. But luckily, my my mom is an uh, engineer, even though she's uh, quite quite a bit older than me. 
uh, but she has the mind to understand and somehow the, your explanation and your way of, of putting it really spoke to her. So I, I think that's a, that's a big thing and uh, you accomplished there. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I do hear that a lot as people's, you know, parents or people who aren't necessarily technical do get a, a light bulb moment, um, especially when mining is explained, because I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And there's a lot of voodoo and a lot of misconceptions about mining in the media even still to this day. Um, and so it's, you know, it's something that when you grasp it, it really helps you understand how the design of Bitcoin, how it's designed to have a certain emission schedule, a certain supply curve. Um, all of this stuff is, is really kind of important to be able to defend the ideas of Bitcoin, you know, that it is actually decentralized, that it is actually um, immutable. Like all of these concepts that we talk about, the goal of the book was not just to teach you the concepts, but to teach you in a way that you could probably explain to somebody else and walk them down that same path. Uh, and that's why I called it inventing Bitcoin, because it really is the process of inventing Bitcoin. You know, I, I don't know how Satoshi invented Bitcoin, obviously, but, or, you know, I can sort of think of it by looking at his reasoning and saying, okay, here are the problems he saw with money. You know, it's, it's not private. You've got, you know, identity leakage. It's being debased by banks you know, um, all of these kind of, uh, these issues that he pointed out and then you go and look at, okay, well, how do you solve those specific issues step by step? And, um, and you get Bitcoin, you know, you get the mention of Bitcoin basically. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and, uh, this is also something that I've been talking a lot about with Knut Swanholm about, the you know, inventing versus discovering Bitcoin. And I think, uh, what you are talking about here in your book is inventing the framework of the window through which uh, we can discover Bitcoin that has become mm. evolved this kind of like, a, you know, socioeconomic, uh, psychological, uh, multi um, field discovery rather, yep. you know, like um, the technical side here is very well outlaid. And, and that's why I think the inventing Bitcoin is an apt name for the book. Thanks. Yeah, I think there's an interesting discussion there about invention versus discovery. I mean, it's almost like a little bit of both because we're, we discovered essentially the concept of digital scarcity, right? Which we thought was not even possible uh, because in digital in the digital realm, we're used to the idea that we can copy and paste, and you know, to infinity any music file or photo or or even um, you know money that we send digitally is really just a transmission of data. So today we need a centralized party in the middle of any of those things in order for it to be not a copy, right? So when you send money from person A to person B digitally, usually there's a bank in the middle and that bank is the one that's ensuring that there's some central record that knows that money has actually been spent. So it's not being copied and pasted because if people could copy and paste money, we'd have a big problem, right? Um, and Bitcoin was the first time that we discovered that, hey, it's actually possible to prevent the copy and pasting and have true scarcity but not has to have that bank or somebody in the middle that is regulating it and, and is making sure, you know, that each transaction is okay. Uh, and then that gives them ultimately control over the transaction. So uh, I think that kind of is the discovery. Uh, to me, the invention part is, you know, how do you put the pieces together? Because the pieces of Bitcoin, um, the, the pieces that make up Bitcoin were not really that unique. They were around for a long time. If you look at Bitcoin's prehistory, you know, some of the technology in Bitcoin is 30 or 20 years old by the time it makes it into Bitcoin. Even proof of work, uh, which is kind of, a lot of people think it's like the core thing about Bitcoin, right? It's that we burn energy to produce Bitcoin. That is not Bitcoin's invention. That's Adam Beck's invention from 1998. So by the time Bitcoin comes around, it's already been around for quite a while. So Bitcoin wasn't really about putting, it wasn't really about um, inventing some new thing. It was actually about putting those pieces together to make digital security work. Yeah, exactly. That's like inventing the wheel, like circular saves have always been there. Like, mm -hmm. like basically the number space has always been there and we just <laughs> use those tools to, in a creative way, uh, to invent new ways to utilize these things that are already there. So, you know, mm -hmm. discovering new uses for them. It's very fascinating. So you already mentioned about the, you know, solving the double spending problem, right? Which, which is something that you go through in the, in the beginning of the book which I think is, it is the, you know, the, the problem, the age old problem that we have been trying to solve with money since forever. And, uh, and, and maybe now it's uh, for the first time in human history that it's actually solved. So maybe uh, dive into that a little bit more. 
Yeah. So I think the word, you know, double spending problem, it's a little bit foreign to people. It sounds scary. Like what, what problem? There's no problem, right? Uh, I don't have this problem in real life. So what problem is Bitcoin actually solving? So, uh, you know, what, what that refers to is the idea that when you spend money, right, or, or you send any object to anybody else, if it's, you know, a bare instrument, if it's like a physical thing, like a, a dollar bill or a gold coin, if I take it from my hand and give it to somebody else's hand, I obviously don't have it anymore. So there's no double spending problem there because once I've spent it, it's done, right? In the digital realm, though, if I send a digital dollar or a digital asset of any sort to anybody else, could be a, a music file or video, I haven't lost access to that music file or video, right? I still have it. I still have that digital dollar unless there's somebody in the middle of that transaction. So as an example, um, you know, like there's iTunes, right? There's Apple's uh, store for music and movies and stuff. The reason that store works and the reason that when you pay for a movie and then you get it and you can watch it for 24 hours and then you lose access to it, the only reason that works is because Apple's in the middle of that, right? And what they're doing is they're issuing this digital right to you and then they're revoking it. So they're that central party and they're ensuring effectively like the fake scarce, scarcity of that music because it's not actually scarce. You can then make a digital copy of that music and you can send it to a million people and that doesn't really cost you anything. So Satoshi was trying to solve that same problem, but in the realm of money. So how do you prevent somebody, how do you make a monetary system where you can send money digitally, but then the other person, when they receive it, you no longer have that money. Who, who ensures that? So in a banking system, you have the bank that's in the middle of that transaction, right? So when two people send each other money, whether it's PayPal, Apple Pay, or credit cards, or you know anything, there's always somebody in the middle and that somebody could be a bank, could be a corporation, um, you know, could be both. Those things are really just keeping a database of everybody's accounts. And they're just moving, you know, numbers around. They debit one account, they take numbers out of it, and they put numbers in somebody else's account. So because that central party is there, that system works, and there's no double spending problem. Uh, now, what Satoshi was trying to do is say, okay, well, what happens if we remove the bank? We want to have a peer-to-peer uh, electronic cash system. That's what Bitcoin is, right? If you look at the white paper, it's called peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. What does that mean? Cash is a bare instrument, something you have in your hand, you give it to somebody else. Peer-to-peer -peer means there's no bank in the middle, right? There's no, there's nobody who's not your peer, some other person on the network. So the way that Bitcoin does this is it replaces the banks with a network of anybody, which, uh, you know, which are the nodes of, of the Bitcoin network. And these nodes, they all store a copy of what the bank usually has, which is a ledger system. They have a ledger of accounts and they show how money is then moving. So in Bitcoin, we have the same exact idea. We have everybody uh, who wants to be a bank can be a bank. They plug into the network and they get a copy of the ledger. And that's the first sort of building block of Bitcoin. But then of course you say, well, if everybody has a ledger, then how come I can't just you know go into my ledger and give myself a million dollars and all of a sudden I'm super rich, right? Well, that's where uh, the whole process of mining and uh, proof of work and everything like that comes in because what that system creates is a single point of entry into when new records can enter into the ledger. It creates a certain barrier to entering uh, records into the ledger such that not everybody can do it. It requires a certain amount of energy to do that. It requires there's a certain kind of lottery system which we can get into. Uh, and, and this creates a... Um, kind of a gate to, to writing into the ledger, but not in the sense where in a banking system, the gate is there's only one bank. In Bitcoin, anybody can be that participant, but there, it requires essentially energy and some luck to, to become that, uh, that gatekeeper that gets to put in a transaction. And then once you do that, and once the transaction is written to the ledger, everybody else in the network gets to validate whether you play by the rules, whether those transactions follow the rules of Bitcoin, whether they actually have been spent before or not, whether they hit they follow rules like, you know, the, the issue and schedule of Bitcoin and things like that. And that creates a very strong effect in Bitcoin where nobody can cheat. Even the people with the money, the miners, the, with, the, with the massive operations and electricity um, and mining facilities, they can't really cheat. They can't change the rules of Bitcoin and do something that's outside of those rules because whenever they spend those coins, they would just be rejected by the recipient. So it's a very interesting system of, of these parties keeping each other honest, essentially. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. And, and before we, well, let's move on to the mining next, but I want to make a couple more co uh, comments about what you just said. And I think uh, what, what you explained and what you described here is the crux of hard money versus easy money, right? I mean, it's so easy to press 
button on the computer and money appears on the account and then you can lend it and then that's that's how money is created or, or rather as you say currency uh, bitcoin is money and fiat is currency uh, so mm -hmm. yeah that's that's uh, that's something that we need to go into and uh, and all the thermodynamics and and why it's important to have this proof of work. And the one more thing about the yep. cash, you know, like cash is instant settlement, right? Like you said, you have the cash in your hand, you give it to somebody and then you don't have the cash in hand and the other person does. And it's uh, your, the debt is settled or the payment is settled. What, what I feel like uh, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion uh, about what cash means. Like there's people who misinterpret this like electronic uh, uh, peer, peer to peer cash system. Like it's just uh, about payments. Like it's just making uh, payments like medium of exchange, but it's also about settlement. And I think mm -hmm. what a lot of people don't understand is that when you pay with Visa, for example, or PayPal, it's not instant settlement, right? It takes maybe weeks in the background. You just don't know what, how it so works. Sometimes it months, you, you can <laughs> right. reverse Visa transaction <laughs> yeah, yeah, months right. later. Right. So and that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fun funnily enough, you know, people often think that it's a downside that, uh, you know, Bitcoin transactions are irreversible, but that's precisely what makes it cash because it is irreversible and it is final settlement. And that's what is amazing because you can settle a debt or a payment globally anywhere from anybody in a matter of, you know, depending on the fees that you want to pay, but a matter of uh, hours rather than days or weeks or months. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it it really is amazing. And I think that's an important distinction. So I think let's talk about two things. So the distinction between hard money and soft money or fiat money, um, as you mentioned, basically in our world that we know today, all money is fiat money, which is, is just money backed by nothing. The government can create as much of it as they want. Banks can create loans, denominated that money as much as they want. Uh, I mean, the, the supply of dollars is always growing, right? And as we know from the last year, uh, we saw a dramatic increase in the supply of, of dollars and also other currencies all over the world because effectively we are uh, in America, the world's reserve currency. And you know we kind of impact everybody else's monetary policy when we print lots of dollars. So that system is actually the system that Satoshi was trying to subvert, right? That he didn't like that. And he explicitly said uh, something to the effect of, you know, we trust the banks not to debase our money, but the history of fiat currency is, is filled with the breaches of that trust. And if you look at it from that standpoint, you will look in history and the, every great empire that ever was had a great currency that was a world reserve currency. And sure enough, what happened is they debased the currency, uh, which in traditional terms used to mean the currency was made of gold or silver, and they just kept decreasing the amount of gold and silver in it until it became kind of junk. Um, or, Another form of debasement would be when it's backed by gold or silver. So in the United States, we had, you know, early dollars were basically IOUs on gold. So you actually had a um, $20 bill that said redeemable for gold, right? You could take it to the Federal Reserve uh, and redeem for gold, except for then they made that illegal. So at some point, the gold backing was removed. And now all we have left is this fiat currency. So it has no physical commodity backing. So Bitcoin is very different from that. Bitcoin specifically is fixed in supply and it's, it's intentionally difficult to create. So you can't just snap your fingers and create it out of thin air because, you know, I explain this to high schoolers and it's funny because high schoolers really have an easy time understanding this, but, uh, you know, Harvard trained economists have a real hard time with this. The real basic concept of supply and demand, right? There's, you know, one chair and there's a hundred dollars in the world versus one chair and a million dollars in the world, right? The more dollars there are, then the more the value of that thing relation relative to the dollars will be affected, right? The dollars will, will lose value relative to the physical goods and services that exist. And, you know, you don't have to look very far. Just look, if you're looking for a candy advertisement from the fifties, you'll see that things used to cost a nickel. Now they cost a dollar or, you know, minimum wage in 1963 was five silver quarters. I just saw this meme was put out on Twitter somewhere. Uh, you know, five silver quarters, which today are worth actually like 20 some dollars. That was the minimum wage in 1963, right? So uh, if you look at that yeah. framework, then you see that the problem isn't really that um, that we don't have enough money. The problem is that the, the money has to be, has to hold value, has to be hard. Uh, and how do you make it hold value? Well, you prevent people from creating more, right? Create more of something and loses value. And um, this is something that there's a great paper by Nick Zabo called Shelling Out, where he goes to the history of money and he talks a lot about this concept of unforgeable costliness. So for money to be good, 
uh, useful for transactions, useful for storing value. You have to be, have some assurance that nobody can just create it out of thin air because otherwise you don't have any assurances that it won't just lose all of its value tomorrow, right? Uh, and we have this throughout history. We have lots of situations of hyperinflation, currency debasement, where the currency just evaporates because people lose faith in it because it's been printed to infinity. And so of course it loses value. So Bitcoin is hard money. It, it actually enforces those rules by creating this unforgeable costliness, the idea that you can't just create out of thin air, you actually have to put in some kind of input of work. And in Bitcoin, that input of work is in the form of energy, uh, real world energy, which we know, you know, from the first law of thermodynamics, you can't create or destroy energy. It, it requires work to convert, say, hydro, you know, water flowing to electricity, right? It, it requires work to convert coal to electricity. You have to create, you have to put in the work to do that. And then Bitcoin takes that electricity and then it uses it in the mining process to give us a sense that any, any Bitcoin that was formed and discovered really mined, uh, came from the consumption of real world resources. So now we know that nobody can create it out of thin air. And that's what gives Bitcoin its hardness and, and very critical property for Bitcoin to be successful as money. Um, because otherwise, you know, anybody can print, put it, push a button and print it. Uh, we have a problem. And, and this again goes back to this concept of, you know, in the banking system, only the Federal Reserve and only certain banks can sort of create money. Um, but in Bitcoin, because anybody can participate in the network, it's absolutely critical that we use some real world objective measure uh, of what it took to create that Bitcoin. Otherwise, we wouldn't know if it was counterfeit or came from, you know, where it came from. And that's, that's what proof of work is about. Yes, well said. And, you know, it's about standardization of uh, measuring the value, right? And this is something actually that we came across with the, when we were thinking about the uh, translating the Bitcoin standards by Zafidin. And a lot of people understand it like, well, yeah, it's, it's like gold standard, so Bitcoin standard, but not exactly necessary uh, because we're also talking about standardization of measurement of value, right? Just like mm -hmm. you said, you know, but we have a way to now uh, verify that they will, that the, the measure stick will not change measure stick will remain constant. So we can now start to measure all value in this stick that does not uh, flex. So I'm mm -hmm. a construction engineer, so I like this uh, metaphor a lot. So for example, <laughs> you know, you imagine trying to build a house and, and you have a measure stick, but you don't know every, every day it's getting a little bit shorter. You just don't know exactly how much. <laughs> so, right. you know, you, the, we're, we're building this kind of society with that kind of a stick, you know, the fiat society, and it's about to collapse because, you know, yeah, it, we, it's, it's, you cannot rely on that. You cannot uh, make long-term decisions based on that because you, you don't know how, how long the stick is going to be tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good analogy. And I will take it even one step further. It's as if we have a stick that's shrinking, but then we actually have somebody in charge of that stick that's like, hey, if we shrink the stick by 50%, it's going to look like our house is twice as big. So that sounds pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's, let's make our house really, really giant by like just shrinking the stick, right? Yeah. And that's basically yeah. what the government's doing. They're like, let's just like shrink the value of the dollar so that everything looks like it's going up, you know? And uh, everybody's really happy because everything's going up. The stock market's up and house prices are up. And, oh, but food costs are up too. Mm -hmm. You know, so like what's happening, right? We're shrinking the stick. We're shrinking the, the value of the dollar and it's causing everything to look big in, in proportion. And what have we really done? We, we actually have distorted all markets and it's worse than building a house because a house is one thing. Here, it's like the entire world and it's right. extremely complicated how everything interrelates. So we're distorting that everything that's happening in the world by, by screwing up the stick and, uh, and it's all happening in nonlinear ways. The effects are nonlinear. So it's, it's much, much worse than messing with a ruler that's uh, for building a house. Yeah, for sure. And there's also shrinkflation. Like if you talk about food, like look at the Big Mac size in the seventies. Um, you know, and you'll get it now and price has gone up, uh, multiple times, uh, while the, while the actual product is smaller and uh, you can see this anywhere, you know, if you look at old packaging of uh, chocolate bars or whatever, um, you will find out that actually, and this is how people get fooled into thinking like, oh, well, the inflation is not that bad. I mean, the same product that I bought 10 years ago, it's about the same price, but actually you're getting maybe, uh, 70% of the pro product that you used to buy. And, and then, uh, you know, the price is higher also. So there's that's right. many, many ways that this, uh, kind of like value and quality of life is being stolen from people just by, uh, meddling with the, with the measure stick. 
But yeah, maybe, maybe let's move, move on to the mining because that's really the really the point here, how to make the money hard and, and to make kind of like tie it into real world consequences via thermodynamics and energy expenditure. And this is, mm-hmm. by the way, something that currently is, is the, is the I, I feel like the dominating thought narrative against Bitcoin, you know, climate change and blah, blah, blah. And uh, by the way, as a side note, uh, probably you, you watched the uh, episode with uh, Saifa Dian and, and Jordan Peterson. Where, where I've, uh, I've seen some clips. I haven't had the chance yeah, to watch the whole thing. The, the, I saw the mind blowing. Yeah, part. exactly. The, well, that's that's the, that's what I'm talking about. Like this realization, <laughs> I think, is going to happen more and more in the world that actually Bitcoin is. If there's such a like, let's put that aside. If, if a climate change is a problem that we need to solve or not, but if, if it is, then Bitcoin is the one that is going to solve it because yeah. of, of the efficiency. So let's let's maybe talk about a little bit of uh, thermodynamics, energy expenditure, proof of work, security model censorship resistant and which all of this brings us to the value proposition, uh, why number go up in Bitcoin. That's right. Okay. There's a lot there. So let's start with the nuts and bolts and then kind of move up uh, in the layers. So why, why does mining exist? Again, mining is really the process. The, mining is a twofold process. One is, is discovering Bitcoin that already exists in the protocol, but needs to be mined just like in a sense, gold needs to be mined, right? There's actually a no some known amount of gold within the earth's crust, right? Somewhere inside of there, there's gold, but we don't actually know how much is in there and we don't know when we're going to discover it. It's kind of random. We have to dig giant holes and we have to see where the gold is, right? It's kind of the same with Bitcoin in a sense, except for it's just much more transparent. The Bitcoin protocol has defined exactly how many Bitcoin will be issued. And what we say, when we say protocol, it's really a set of rules that are enforced by software. Okay, so it's it, the protocol is really a, a set of rules, more more than anything. So when you connect your computer to the Bitcoin network, that and you run, you know, Bitcoin software, that Bitcoin software has to follow the same rules that every other piece of Bitcoin software follows. Otherwise, it will be, it won't be able to talk to everybody else, right? It has to share that same view of the world. And part of that view of the world is that there is going to be a certain number of Bitcoin, which is close to twenty one million. So the way that works is that uh, there's a cycle in Bitcoin called the halving where every four years, the supply of Bitcoin, the of newly produced Bitcoin is cut in half. And what do we mean by that? Well, all over the world, there's people called miners and anybody could be a miner. It doesn't take anything special. You need a, you need a computer. Um, there are specialized computers called ASICs, which are boxes, they're about this big. They make a lot of noise, they have a fan. <laughs> and what they do is they run uh, an algorithm, which is a, a piece of computer code. It's, it's not complicated. A lot of uh, news articles will say they're uh, solving complex math problems, which is not actually true. Uh, what they're doing is they're running a mathematical function called a hash function, which is basically a sort of r- random number generator that's, that, that works on data. So what they're actually doing, the way that I like to talk about it now is um, think of it like a dartboard, okay? We're trying to find Bitcoin. Just like when we're mining gold, we're just like, we're using a hammer or you know a, a fancy machine but basically we're digging into the earth. And every time we strike the earth, we expend some amount of work, right? We expend some amount of electricity and there's some chance that we'll strike gold. There's also some chance, or there's a large chance that we'll strike nothing, right? Um, so gold takes an enormous amount of energy uh, to produce a tiny little bit of gold because most of the time that energy is wasted in doing nothing. In Bitcoin, it's kind of the same idea. In order to produce Bitcoin or really discover Bitcoin, discover one of the 21 million Bitcoins that is out there, we are doing a, a similar process, except for instead of striking the earth with a hammer, we are throwing a digital dart at a dartboard. And the way we're doing that is, is using these special computers to, to crunch a, a formula, which is not a complex equation by any stretch of imagination, it's just the hash function. It's taking the Bitcoin data, so transactions, people are sending Bitcoin to each other, and it's uh, sticking it together with a random number and it's producing a dart throw. And it's throwing that dart against the giant dartboard, which is about the size of the number of atoms in the universe. It's a very, very large space of possible numbers that, that that computer will produce. And if they land in the bullseye, which is very, very small compared to this giant, you know, total number of atoms in the universe, if they land in that bullseye, they can then share that information with the world and say, hey, here's how I did my dart throw. Here's all the information that went into it. And here's where I landed on the dartboard and everybody else can verify that they actually hit that. And if they verified 
then they get a Bitcoin reward. That Bitcoin that they produce is now considered valid and is written into the ledger and everybody takes a copy of it. So the rules of Bitcoin basically stipulate that you have to hit this bullseye and they enforce the size of the bullseye over time to be smaller or bigger, depending on who is participating in this mining process. But what that does is it, it basically makes it really, really hard to hit that bullseye. It actually becomes proportional to the price of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin's worth, you know, $50,000, it will take you almost $50,000 worth of electricity to hit that bullseye. Because if it was really, if it was worth $50,000, but it only took you $10,000 to hit the bullseye, then lots and lots of people will start mining because it's basically free money. Um, but what the network does when that happens is it shrinks the bullseye so that it's harder and harder to hit it until the point where the price and the cost kind of converge a little bit. What you're describing there is the uh, difficulty adjustment yes. algorithm, which, which uh, Cypher Dian calls the secret sauce of Bitcoin that makes it, makes it work because that's, that's what makes it sure that no matter how much uh, hash rate, how much calculating, how many computers you plug into the network, uh, the network will adjust and, and vice versa. If, uh, like, for example, the uh, miners in China got shut down. So about 40% mm -hmm. of the hash rate dropped off the, of the network. So the network adjusted to that and suddenly everybody else got a discount and it become mi much more profitable to mine elsewhere. That's right. So, so this is, I, I think, uh, for a brief, for a brief amount of time, right? For so, a while. Yeah. Of course. And yeah. So that, what you, what you're describing is that this difficulty adjustment, I, and I agree, is the secret sauce of Bitcoin because almost every other piece of Bitcoin was essentially invented and existed before Bitcoin came along. And proof of work, which is that concept I described around burning electricity and, and showing a number, existed. What didn't exist and nobody could really figure out, which seems obvious in retrospect, is that you can adjust the difficulty of the proof of work uh, dynamically. So over time, right? So as, as more people join the network and more people are throwing these darts, we want to shrink that bullseye and make it more expensive for them to do so. Or vice versa, if what happened in China is half the hash rate of the network, 40% of the hash rate, um, which means 40% of the miners basically just unplugged and said, hey, we're offline. All of a sudden, the bullseye was still this big, but only, you know, there's only uh, half as many people throwing darts at it, right? So now they had to enlarge the bullseye because there was less people mining. So that, that sort of thing adjusts over time. Uh, it either shrinks or grows depending on whether the hash rate shrinks or grows. Uh, so I think that is the key to, to Bitcoin. And if you look at the code, uh, like the actual computer code related to the difficulty adjustment, it's like trivial. It's like five, 10 lines of code, right? It's like really, really basic. It's, it's just, okay, we're going to look back at the last two weeks. There's a, there's a period of time. It's not really two weeks. It's really, you know, 2016 blocks, but because Bitcoin doesn't have a sense of time and has a sense of, of blocks, which are these things that, that the miners discover. Um, but every 2016 blocks, which is roughly two weeks, they look back in time and say, how fast have we been going? Have we been going too fast or too slow? And let's adjust that bullseye based on that. And the interesting thing is that every single node in the network, every computer independently comes, does a calculation. They're not relying on some central authority to tell them what the new number will be. They just all recalculate it for themselves. And because they all run the same calculation algorithm, they all come to the same conclusion, which is the, the, you know, the bullseye is too big by this amount. Okay, shrink it. Or it's too small, enlarge it. Um, and, and that is really the secret sauce of Bitcoin that makes it so that no matter how many people start mining, everybody get in the world gets super greedy and, and turns on a miner, that bullseye is going to get really, really small. It's going to get really, really hard for them to, to, to find the Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting way to make sure that we don't violate these, uh, the supply schedule, which is what I was kind of getting at with the halvings is that every four years, we, you know, or every, uh, you know, a certain number of blocks that is cut in half so that Bitcoin becomes rarer and rarer and rarer to find. And you have to be ultra efficient, um, in order to, to participate in that network because now you're getting less and less Bitcoin in this compensation. Yeah. And it really is important because like you said earlier, you know, we don't know how much gold there is, right? I mean, nobody, we, we've literally scratched the, the surface of Earth and let's not even talk about, you know, asteroids and whatever is out there. You know, right. I, it's safe to assume that there's the infinite amount of gold uh, in, in the existence, at least, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, the universe. Any, any practical, practical yeah. perspective. The point is that, you know, any other resource, except Bitcoin is the only, uh, you know, exception to this rule. If you pour, if, if there's a gold rush and you pour more and more resources and money into mining or, or finding or producing that resource, 
uh, the price of it will go down because more will be found but because it's just a matter of like we, we can just make you know submarines that go go 20 kilometers in, into the oceans and find gold there i mean it, it doesn't matter as long as the price keeps going up you know yep. so that's the effort that is being poured into it but bitcoin absorbs all of that effort and after, after uh 2016 blocks it, it becomes that much harder to find more new Bitcoins. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's truly amazing. It, it makes me warm and fuzzy inside just whenever I think about, because this is such a, such an elegant and simple solution to such a complex problem that has, has been really plaguing huma humanity, you know, forever. Yeah. That's right. And I think, so to circle back now to this energy FUD stuff. So basically what we're talking about there is Okay, we just said, you know, Bitcoin burns a ton of energy, a ton of electricity to produce Bitcoin. Um, and even in the future, in the year roughly 2140, when all of the Bitcoin is fully mined, we're still going to need to do that because in order to write new transactions to the ledger, that's still the same process of mining. So mining is actually the process of discovering new Bitcoin and writing transactions to the ledger, meaning people, you know, spending Bitcoin to each other or, or performing Bitcoin transactions. Um, and that's another thing we can get into because a Bitcoin transaction is not a payment, but <laughs> we can cover that in a second. But essentially, um, you know, what's going to happen is we're going to sort of expend this electricity in perpetuity. And so for a lot of people, this is kind of scary, like, oh my God, it's going to burn down the world and, and so on, right? So one of the things that people, I think, th don't have a good conception on, and, and this is often um, misconstrued in the media, and when they say Bitcoin, you know, burns as much electricity as Argentina or some, um, or they'll say some country, right? So in your mind, you picture an entire country and all that country is doing is burning electricity for no reason at all, except for like, you know, tech bros to like, you know, gamble, right? That, that's, that's the mind of the, of the average uh, sort of mainstream media reader, right? Uh, the reality of Bitcoin mining is actually quite different because, because of this difficulty adjustment, right? Actually, you have to be ultra efficient. You have to have really, really low energy costs because if you think about it, if you come into the Bitcoin network with a high energy cost and the difficulty goes up, then all the people on lower energy costs are going to have a good time mining and you're going to have a really bad time until the point where you're unprofitable and you actually have to get kicked off the network. So what actually happens is there's not a country full of Bitcoin miners. Bitcoin miners go to where electricity is the cheapest. But where is electricity the cheapest? Well, where there's no other demand for it, right? Because electricity is a supply and demand market. So it's not like if you look in the media, they're like, this could power, you know, 100,000 homes. Well, no, it can't because it's in the middle of nowhere. This electricity is typically stranded resources, right? And actually, when Bitcoin comes to an area and builds an electrical system there or takes advantage of some natural resource like a hydropower plant or wind or, or whatever, uh, they create a subsidy for building electricity there. And that means they actually create a subsidy for creating communities, for creating jobs, for giving electricity to people who never had it before. Uh, actually, Bitcoin 20, uh, 2021, the, uh, 20, 2020, whatever, the previous Bitcoin conference, I met a guy from Congo. And he said, what they're doing down there is they're building Bitcoin mines on solar energy. And these are villages in Congo. They have zero electricity, zero running water, nothing, right? They're coming in there. They're building power plants for the purpose of Bitcoin mining. And then they're using the, the extra energy that they're generating to create electricity for the village, right? Like they're bringing power to people who haven't had it before. So it's not really like stealing energy from other useful uses. It's actually going and finding all the stranded energy in the world that nobody's actually using. And it's utilizing it to create sound money, which, you know, you have to understand how actually powerful that is, right? It's, it's freedom money. It's money that people in these disadvantaged communities can actually use to improve their situation. Uh, people that are unbanked, people who are in countries where they have capital controls and they can't even get access to dollars. I mean, even countries like Argentina, which is relatively, you know, a first world-ish country, like they have extreme capital controls. You know, you can buy $200 uh, of US dollars a month. People, people's currency is devaluing. Their society is going to fall apart unless they have some money. So you have to understand the value of that money. And then you have to understand what Bitcoin is actually doing is subsidizing the development of stranded energy resources, which is actually a good thing for society. And it's not at all this idea that it was sealing this energy that, that would otherwise be useful for hospitals or, or houses or something. It's just nonsense. Um, yeah, and it falls apart if you understand the difficulty adjustment, but unfortunately, <laughs> most people don't. Yeah, I think a lot of people have a naive understanding of energy, like, uh, especially in the first world where, where it's just, you know, you plug in your smartphone to the wall and yet yeah. there's energy and you somehow think that 
all of the energy in the world that has been produced in some kind of a pool. And now if you take a slice of that, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, out of reach for the rest of people who would need it that's for right. something else. But that's not the case. Like, for example, you mentioned that hydropower, like consider, you know, like hydropower is usually next to the river, right? And there's often maybe not that much of other infrastructure that can efficiently use that energy that would come from there. Sure, you can store some of the potential energy on top of the dam, but not infinitely. So what right. often happens is that you will find aluminum production or something like that, high energy production factories built next exactly. to this. And that's where you sink the energy. So, you know, instead of making aluminum cans or, or aluminum bars, you can now make Bitcoin and then you can invest that Bitcoin, use that to build anything, maybe a more, a bigger infrastructure there, maybe bring electricity to the stranded areas that never had that before. You know, because that's Bitcoin right. makes that possible. Just like uh, in that uh, Peterson video we talked about earlier, you know, what he realized is that now you can, uh, you know, you can't move the energy without cost. Right, that much is that's that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. They think right. you put a oh, why don't they put an electrical plant on that hydro dam and transmit electricity a thousand miles away? <laughs> that's not yeah. how it works. You can't do that. But what you can do is mine Bitcoin and then transmit Bitcoin to that village a thousand exactly. miles away in a second. And now all of a sudden you have the the transportation of energy into money, and the money is completely portable. It's instantly portable across the world. That energy is not portable, and actually a lot of energy now you're seeing a lot of development on oil fields and stranded gas and stuff like that, where, you know, in the middle of the oil field, they're, they're pumping all this gas and it's actually just being flared or vented into the atmosphere. So it's actually very bad if you are, you know, following the climate change narrative, then venting methane into the atmosphere is not so good for climate change, right? What would you rather do with that methane is capture it and use it to mine Bitcoin? Because now at least you have sound money as a result of that. And instead of it just being, you know, pumped into the air. So yeah. it's actually a much better thing from that standpoint as well. You know, talking about methane, there's even, even people who are actually now using livestock, uh, you know, waste to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> so, because you get, if you have a farm, a, a meat farm, let's say, or you have a lot of pigs or cows, you know, they uh, produce a lot of ex excrement, which then you can turn into methane and, and the burn that into Bitcoin. It's like, if because there's like this kind of, a, in my opinion, this a little bit of a ridiculous narrative that the cow farts are destroying the, the world somehow. Well, now that narrative is kind of gone because you can turn cow farts into money and, and use the money right. to do whatever you want. <laughs> that's, that's the point is that Bitcoin actually solves a lot of problems and there's maybe even secondary uses. Um, right now I'm following uh, this narrative in Vancouver where they're going to use Bitcoin mining heat, waste heat to, to do some kind of heating project. So that's interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's going to play out, if it's economical, uh, apparently it is. Um, but you know, Bitcoin actually can go to a lot of different places where you have no other solution for the stranded energy and you can actually plug into that stranded energy. And it's also, if you, if you're a fan of green things like wind power and, and solar and stuff like that, Bitcoin can actually act as a subsidy for building those out. And, and, uh, in Texas, this is happening now. So if you Google like ERCOT Bitcoin, um, which is a Texas power grid, you'll see that. Uh, Bitcoin is coming in and uh, acting as a, basically as a base demand, right? The problem with some of these power plants is they're not economical. Like when it goes on, it goes off, uh, it's very high, high cost. You have to build these giant farms. So Bitcoin can come in and actually act as a, as a base demand to subsidize the building out of these power plants. And then if there's a surge in cost, right? And then Bitcoin is not profitable, well, they'll, they'll turn it off, right? And that actually will, will act like a balancing factor for that power grid. So Bitcoin actually has the potential to be a very interesting uh, load balancing technology for power grids. And that actually improves the development of green uh, or renewable you know, resources. So you have to look deeper beyond the surface of, oh my God, Bitcoin's burning X amount of electricity because that's completely out of context. Um, and you know, you can also compare it to, okay, the idle PlayStations burn as much electricity as Bitcoin. Okay, so what, is anybody going after idle PlayStations or you know, idle TV sets that are sitting at home burning that or Christmas lights? I mean. Nobody's going after these things because they think they have use, but they just don't understand the use of Bitcoin. So all of a sudden it becomes enemy number one, even though it's actually not only useful, but actually dramatically an improvement to energy infrastructure rather than a detriment. Yes, exactly. The understanding is key here. And uh, people are afraid of things that they don't understand. I don't blame people for that. And especially with Bitcoin, when you start to hear that a lot of people got rich from the Bitcoin and then you didn't, you have kind of like an incentive to believes that you didn't really miss out on anything that is going to collapse and it's not going to work and it's bad, it's right. going to be banned. 
it's unfortunate, but the, the sooner people realize that and, you know, start reading about it and accept that, okay, maybe I was wrong about this. You know, I was wrong about this and I had to accept that at some point. And I guess it's just the, the longer you prolong that and lie to yourself, the harder it becomes to, and you know, some people are just going to, I guess, have fun staying poor. Yes. I mean, that's the thing is that it's, it is challenging to admit to yourself, but even for me, you know, it took me, I first started Bitcoin in 2011 and it took me several touch points to actually understand it. And for a while I was stuck in like Ethereum and ICO land. And, you know, it's, it's like, you don't beat yourself up for it. Right. I, I wish I was brilliant in 2011. I mean, the first time I bought Bitcoin was a $30. Uh, and then I ended up selling it at two, right? Because I didn't understand what I bought and I thought it was a joke and so on. And I didn't even bother reading the white paper, right? I just bought something because I heard about it on Slashdot. So a lot of people in that boat, you know, I don't beat myself up for it because I just didn't invest the time to understand. And that's what I did. And it took me many thousands of hours to get the depth of understanding and conviction to actually understand, to say, okay, yeah, Bitcoin is the future of money. It's not trivial by any means, you know, and, and most people don't have the time to invest into it. So I don't want to like, say, oh, ha, 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 you don't understand Bitcoin. I think everybody just needs to put in the time. And that was really the goal of writing the book to make it easier. It's shorter. Hopefully it's a little bit more digestible than, you know, some of the bigger stuff that's out there. But I think everybody can can invest two hours and try to read it. And after that, make, maybe make a more informed decision rather than just kind of reading what's in the mainstream media about it burning up the planet because it's completely false. And it literally falls apart with any amount of, you know, thinking. Uh, but you just need to do the thinking rather than the reading. That's that's the problem. Yeah, like, you know, I don't want to um, make people feel bad about that either. I, I heard about Bitcoin in 2010. I was running the software even at that time. But I was, I was nice. running all kinds of software. I was just uh, another play, uh, another toy to play with. I didn't understand. And I read the white paper, I think, 2017. So after that, it was... <laughs> you know, <laughs> after that, I started learning about it. But, you know... It takes time. And, and even if I got it at that time, I'm, I'm sure I would have still done the same as you sold it at, you know, for sure. Whatever. Cause it was insane and it was wild and it was an experiment. Yeah. Like, so uh, your highest, the highest <laughs> respect to those people who, who held from those times. Yeah, if there are many. people like that, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how many there are really, but yeah, yeah, that's, that would be amazing because it was so much, there were people, I think, to be fair, that understood it really early on. And this is where I'm like, I have insane respect for people like Bitstein and, and Pierre Richard because they were writing in 2014 when Bitcoin was under a billion dollars and they were explaining exactly what would play out, the currency speculation attacks. They would just, everything was explained. It was right there. And like, they literally predicted it. And I, now I read it and I'm like, wow, these guys are just brilliant. But perhaps all they were was the coming at it from a beginner's mind, like first principles, just like, hey, Let's set everything we know aside and like, let's just follow the logic. Where does it lead us? Because I think the problem nowadays is that we are so smart. We know so much stuff. All that smart stuff, it impacts us, our ability to, to understand because we, we know economics. We know how fiat money works. We know the Fed is, is the savior of our economy. You thank God the Fed is here that we're not in a great depression right now, right? These are the things we know. But if we set them aside for a second and think from first principles, then we come to different conclusions. And that's, I think, something that's very much missing these days is very few people are willing to set aside their preconceived notions and think from first principles. Right. I mean, you, you know, do yourself a favor. I put your ego uh, in, the, in the side for a while. It doesn't cost you much. And have another look. I know it's, it's hard when you're invested all your life. The older you get and the more you've invested in the lies that fiat world is built on, the more difficult it is to put that aside and start from scratch. But it's not too late. Like you, I hear it all the time that, you know, uh, I'm not gonna look into it now. It's, it's too late for me. It's not about, it's not a, you know, get rich quick scheme. It's, uh, you know, forget about the dollar valuation. This is about protecting your wealth mm-hmm. and your ability to function and your family, you know, multi, multi, uh, generational wealth. This is what we're talking about. You know, the new, yeah. new golden age. This is not like, yeah, I, I will flip it for more fiat after two years that no, forget about that. And I would go beyond, it's not just wealth. It's also freedom, right? Because wealth is no good if you have no freedom with your wealth, right? You could be extremely wealthy in Venezuela, but like, good luck getting your money out or, you know, like in, in any of these countries that have capital controls. So you have freedom and that freedom with your money leads to a freer society. I think it's the key of free society, right? Because the freedom to to speak with your money is such an important part of it. You can, if you can shout from the rooftops that you can't make any economic effects in the in the society, then you're not really free. So, 
the money has to be free, speech has to be free too, but those two things have to be together. So um, Bitcoin is the only form of free money we have left. Uh, every other money is now censorship money. It's going to get worse because it's going fully digital, fully centralized. So now people are going to be forced to make that choice. And hopefully they make the choice um, before the choice is made for them, you know, because once your country is fully on lockdown and, you know, all your Bitcoin exchanges are banned. I mean, there's always going to be a black market for Bitcoin. There's always going to be peer to peer exchange and all that. But right now is the golden era. Like Bitcoin's available almost anywhere. Go and get some. There's not really a reason not to have some Bitcoin because that is the only free money left in the, mo- in the world. And by free, I mean Libre, not as in beer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well said. And yeah, what I mean by wealth is uh, to have your time that nobody can dilute your time and waste your time and take it. And Bitcoin is a great tool for uh, preserving that. And, you know, I think it's reckless not to own any Bitcoin, to be honest. It's for sure. like, as, just as in, uh, a little bit, I think Satoshi said the same thing, you know, just get a little bit in case uh, it, it works out. If, if, if it works out, people are going to be completely left out in the cold. If you have some, at least you have some kind of an insurance, you know, like people take insurances. Why not, why not this? You know, it's, right. it's Getting a small amount of Bitcoin is also a nice incentive to learn more because it's hard to incentivize to learn more until you're actually like your sort of wealth and, and you know, your your uh, self-worth is dependent on something. And then if you have a significant amount of Bitcoin, then all of a sudden you have to start thinking, why is it doing this? Why is it doing that? Maybe I should read it and actually understand what's what's happening here. Yeah, it's been a nice conversation. I think we, we can start to wrap up here, but I, I wanted to, if you have a little bit of time, I wanted to do one more point here and then we can we sure. maybe close it up. So um, why is it said that you can't own Bitcoin? So I think this is uh, something that you hear among the Bitcoiners. Uh, it's kind of like a, a mind game or, or um, you know, a play in the mind to think that, uh, do you really own Bitcoins? And, and I think the idea behind this is what you also talk about in the, in the latter parts of your book uh, is the vast number space. Like the, these are just a huge, huge numbers, the Bitcoins actually, that we also talked about earlier in this episode that we kind of like discovered a way to utilize these numbers. So yeah, I mean, I guess when, when you, when you own Bitcoin, all you really own is a key, which is a really just a giant number that allows you to spend that Bitcoin, right? So it's actually kind of like, well, what do you actually own? Well, you, you own the rights to sign a transaction in the future to spend that Bitcoin. That's what owning Bitcoin really is. Um, and actually I wanted to dive really quick and I, I do have to stop in a minute, but the, the idea of a Bitcoin transaction, I think is really a, a key thing. Um, it's not a payment between two peers. It could be that, but that's a really, really basic version of a Bitcoin transaction. A Bitcoin transaction could also be thousands of payments. A Bitcoin transaction could also be the execution of a piece of code. Um, it could be a fairly sophisticated conditional thing. Like it could be a multi-signature, uh, spending contract that says you can spend if three out of five people have signed off and it's a certain period of time is fast. And now with the, with the upgrade of Bitcoin with Taproot, we're going to have really, really complex versions of those scripts. So we're really creating a programmable type of money and a Bitcoin transaction is the settlement of, it's a, really the final settlement, as you said, you know, of, of that contract. And there could be so many things that are done with this. Uh, as an example, we already have Lightning Network, which is essentially a piece of code that runs on a Bitcoin network that the Bitcoin code knows how to execute. And you spe- and you create a transaction, but the transaction is not sending money. What it's doing is it's creating a special kind of new layer network called the Lightning Network, where that where that Bitcoin is now locked up in that Lightning Network and, and can travel much more quickly, uh, much more cheaply, right? So. The constructs we're going to be able to build on top of Bitcoin are just starting to become explored. And there's almost an infinite amount of things we can do there. And that's the key that when people say, oh, print Bitcoin can only do seven transactions a second or whatever. Well, that seven, one of those transactions could be the settlement of millions of Bitcoin payments on Lightning Network. Um, or it could be something even more exotic that we haven't even thought of yet. So uh, Bitcoin transactions, it actually doesn't matter how fast or slow they are. It could be seven transactions a second forever because we're going to find out new ways of squeezing more stuff into those transactions. Because the transactions at the end of the day is just the final settlement of a piece of data. And that's really the, the key um, information here because with data, we can do anything. And so we're going to see a lot of really cool expansions to the Bitcoin network and what's possible with it. Um, and the, really the only limitation is the value, right? The value pie that Bitcoin represents, which today is over a trillion dollars. So today we can settle over a trillion dollars worth of value over the network. If tomorrow that value is 10 trillion or 100 trillion, now all of a sudden, you know, you can settle 
100 million lightning payments worth hundreds of billions of dollars in one transaction. Uh, and I think that's, that's the key that a lot of people miss as far as what Bitcoin means, really. Yeah, that's, that's really good that you brought it out. And, and that's also something that you hear in the FUD that you know, the per transaction energy cost, that's like a uh, complete yeah. shit. It, it, it has doesn't no make meaning. any sense. It's no meaning, right? <laughs> so anytime, anytime you see per transaction energy cost, like immediately just turn off whatever yeah. uh, source you're reading because they don't understand Bitcoin. They don't understand what a Bitcoin transaction is. And you can't publish Bitcoin research if you don't understand what a Bitcoin transaction is. I'm sorry, disqualified. Yeah, exactly. So to sum up, Bitcoin is programmable, free, unstoppable, unconfiscatable, digital cash. So go get some. And Jan, thank you so much uh, for your time. For you have, do you have any final remarks? Uh, where can people find more about you? Or um, you? No, it was, it was my pleasure. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, the handle is scoop, S-K-W-P. And then you can also find uh, my company, which is Swan Bitcoin at swan.com. Uh, we sell Bitcoin. We help people uh, buy Bitcoin on a recurring basis. We also help uh, companies, high net worth individuals, entities of any sort, trusts, IRAs. Uh, so come hang out with us and we will help you with any Bitcoin questions you may have. Um, and you can get the book uh, all over the internet. Just type in Inventing Bitcoin to Google. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jan. And thank you, uh, viewers, listeners. Remember to subscribe to our channel, hit the bell button to get the next author cast. Gonna keep making these with the other authors. And it was a, it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation. So Likewise. thank you and see you next Thanks time. Hey, All right. Cool. Bye-bye. <laughs>